we come today to uh, another in our sections on uh, looking at Mark's gospel. And uh, today we're going to continue with uh, Mark chapter 3. Let me just pull that up for you. So you can see we're going to be uh, looking at Mark 3, uh, verses 20 to 35, what's called a, a Mark and a Mark sandwich. Uh, sounds tasty, I know. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and uh, Jesus' mother's and uh, brothers so um get ready for for that and um my background today is part of uh, capernaum uh where peter lived and jesus spent his time and, and lived also so what will you pray with me as we begin father god thank you for this opportunity we've got to study uh, the book of mark and i pray that you may open our eyes to hear what you are saying to us in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so uh, previously to this, we were following on looking at uh, the earlier part of Mark chapter 3. But it works uh, in a sense to then uh, stop where we stopped, even though the way our sections go, they tag this on with uh, looking at the 12 apostles. But, but the verse 20, 21 is an important uh, sort of like top layer, if you like, the sandwich. Uh, because then Jesus went home. And let me just share this screen with you. Uh, I think we've, we've seen it before, but this is, uh, imagine that we're standing in um, the courtyard, if you like, of uh, just a, a synagogue in uh, uh, Capernaum. And you're looking over to, this looks like a bit of a UFO that's landed, but it's just a viewing platform to underneath is uh, Peter's home. And Jesus either spent time at Peter's house, quite a nice affluent house. Um, Peter, of course, who ran his own fishing business. Jesus either spent his time there or uh, they don't know when they referred to uh, his home, whether he had his own home. Remember, Jesus was from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee, because Nazareth itself was so small, they had to refer to the bigger area it was next to. Um, but one of those two areas, this was Capernaum, so... Um, about 20 miles away from uh, Nazareth. <clears throat> so just gives you a sort of perspective on, on what we're looking at. So uh, Jesus, verse 20, Jesus went home and the crowd gathered again. <laughs> Peter and Peter's mother-in-law and others uh, must have been a bit frustrated uh, that there was such this crowd all the time. No, I'm sure they weren't. Um, but it didn't mean that they couldn't eat anything. And then when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he was out of his mind. Wow. Okay. So this is your top layer of your Mark and Sandwich. We're going to return to Jesus' mothers and brothers later on. The middle bit of the, the meat of the sandwich is a very significant piece, which we'll come on to, to in a moment. Um, so Jesus was here. He's in Capernaum. And uh, said either at his own or, or Peter's house. And Nazareth, where his family were coming from, was 20 miles away. So they had hiked 20 miles to come and seize Jesus and take him home because they really felt Jesus just lost it. And uh, this is not unusual. Now, we know that many of Jesus' uh, half-brothers, uh, and of course his mother as well, were, were strong in their faith to the end. You can imagine to start off with, this is Jesus whom they'd grown up with. Okay, Mary knew there were some interesting things happening at Jesus' birth, and she treasured those things in her heart. Um, and maybe by this time, of course, Joseph's died, and uh, Jesus should have been taken on his responsibility as the oldest son in the family, running the family business. And what is he doing? He's gallivanting across the country, um, doing this sort of preaching, teaching, and claiming he's, he's somebody. And um, you can imagine why they thought, Jesus, you lost it. You know, come home, grow up, just have a cold shower, whatever it is, just, just chill. Um, tough, tough, really. Um, and then going on to verse 22, let's look at the part of this sandwich. Uh, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, and I wonder if they viewed some of this that was going on with Jesus' parents, Jesus' mother and brothers, uh, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. 
this is incredibly strong language. Remember, they've just uh, seen Jesus heal a man with a withered hand. Um, they had a lot of confidence in, in the devil doing some incredible healing ministry. It's like, wow. Um, they're referring to Jesus as Satan. U ultimately, that's what it was. Beelzebul, the prince of demons, um, they refer to the same person, to, to, to Satan. Jesus was empowered by Satan to cast out demons because that's what he was also doing. Uh, that's slightly strange, uh, slightly ironic. You know, even Jesus can reading. And, he, and Jesus called to them and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Well, exactly. Uh, if he's called Beelzebul, the prince of demons, if he's called Satan, how can he be casting out demons? Uh, doesn't quite make sense. I think maybe the family should be the ones who are carding scribes and Pharisees off for being crazy, not Jesus. Um, his family, of course, think he's crazy. The religious leaders think he's possessed. I mean, that is just, wow. You, you just, you can't even comprehend that. And you think of all the people, really, the scribes would have understood what was going on. I remember the scribes knew, of course, the Old Testament very well. And um, they knew all the passages relating to uh, the Messiah. So go to Isaiah 49. And Isaiah was one of those passages that talked about the exile and talked about the people in the exile, the exile when uh, the Israelites were, were carted off uh, by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Um, and then Isaiah talks about how they will come back. Um, so Isaiah 49, 24, a prophecy, a lot of prophecies in Isaiah were pointing towards the Messiah, pointing towards Jesus. Isaiah 49, 24, can the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Can the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of tyrants be rescued? See, the person is strong enough, this savior is strong enough to save them from the enemies. Jesus was the one who was going to save them from their enemies. He was the one who's strong enough. Uh, Isaiah uh, 56, verse 31. Uh, sorry, 50, uh, uh, 63. I got my numbers wrong. Isaiah 63, verse 1. The day of the Lord's vengeance. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bosra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. This is a prophecy. People would have known about it. The Lord is coming as one who is strong, one who is mighty to save. Jesus is the one who's mighty to save. John the Baptist, remember, when he talked about there being one who would come, one who is mightier or stronger than he. And here we have Isaiah talking about the one who has come, who is indeed mighty to save. But there's an irony in all this when we uh, come to face to face with, with one who is strong in that, um, you know, they got it wrong. They thought that Jesus was actually uh, from the other side, if you like. Um, and a lot of their expectations were, were focused on what they saw in a Messiah, what they wanted uh, this Messiah, this Savior to be, and not actually who he was. Uh, their idea was that the Messiah should keep the Torah and uh, should overthrow the Romans. And um, and yet, uh, you know, and there are, there are many passages in the Old Testament that, that do describe a Messiah in this way. But they miss out the balance to that. The, the other side of that, which actually is the Messiah, would also come one who would uh, bear the sin, who, who would be the suffering servant. Uh, and so, yes, would overthrow the Romans, but not in the way they were looking for to overthrow the Romans. Um, Isaiah 53, 12. Um, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. 
yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Yes, Jesus would be this mighty to save uh, leader, but he would also be one who bore the sin of many. That's part of it, laying down his life, uh, no greater love for somebody, and make intercession for the transgressors. What, uh, what sort of great uh, victory language, if you like, there. Um, and again, there's that question for us. Well, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, had a very specific picture of how they expected uh, this Messiah to be. Um, I, do we have sort of a picture of, of this Jesus who will uh, bow his knee to us and do what we tell him to do and, and heal and provide? And, you know, because if so, yes, we have a loving Heavenly Father who loves to hear our voice, uh, but we miss out passages, passages about uh, truth and, and love. And um, anyway, so, so they're, they're blinded. They, they focus on Jesus uh, being possessed. Uh, verse 20, uh, let's carry on reading. Uh, and so he called them to him and said to them, Parallels, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Showing, you know, how can Satan um, fight against Satan? And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless you first bind the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder the house. What has Jesus done? He's come to bind up Satan and to free the captives. Jesus come to bind up Satan. And when he's done that, then he can enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods. Um, and Jesus said, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Verse 28 to 30, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Um, a sin that will never be forgiven. Uh, you know, um, there'll be times when we ask the question, don't we? And I've had people ask me the question, have I committed that sin? What is that sin? And they, they come out with a list of, of certain sins uh, and say, well, that, that is the sin. That is the unforgivable sin. You commit that, that is it. Not a chance. Those people are not in the kingdom. Well, let's see what, what Jesus is saying. Uh, first thing is, tr Jesus said, truly, I say to you. Now, remember, people say, uh, it is written. You've heard that it is written. Um, even Jesus said, I say to you. But here he's saying, truly, truly, I say to you. We're going to understand the, the extreme uh, emphasis here. This is really important. It's already in this Mark and Sandwich. Um, just to draw out, squeeze out the middle section as being really important. Truly, I say to you. So this is important. There is forgiveness for all sins, except sinning when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. What is that meaning? Well, let's have a look. Um, and, and notice how he says, he suddenly brings in blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. They've been speaking ill of the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, hang on a minute. The scribes never mentioned the Holy Spirit there. So, so what is Jesus saying? Jesus is pointing out work done by the Holy Spirit. Work done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Who are they saying Jesus has done this work by? The Holy Spirit? No. They're saying Jesus is doing these things in, in the power of Satan. And he's doing it for Satan's benefit. Um, he's possessed by Beelzebul and the prince of demons. Jesus is doing his work by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're saying it's by somebody else. They're denying the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, if they continue to say that uh, Jesus is doing things by Satan's power, for Satan, and they're not remorseful, then they're not going to repent, and there will be no forgiveness. There is no space for those people in heaven if ultimately they're denying the work of God. God is not important in their life. They're not going God's way. No. That's, that's the situation. It's a warning for them to turn 
from that. There's repentance for anyone who turns to Christ, who recognizes Jesus in their lives. What's the relevance for us? Uh, you know, because there might be people who seriously wrestle with this. Have I committed that unforgivable sin? Well, the unforgivable sin is not recognizing the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Even just by wrestling with this, you're beginning to recognize that the Holy Spirit is working in, in your life already. But if you're really struggling with this, then uh, pick up the phone, contact a Christian leader that you know of. But this unpardonable sin, uh, some fear that they've committed it, um, and um, some worry too much about it, some don't worry enough about it. I think there's that, that balance that we've got to get there. Um, and um, remember also that the Bible says there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who believe in Jesus Christ. So it's making sure that we're going his way and not our way. Uh, we can come to Jesus in repentance for whatever we've done wrong. And uh, we will know that his, his mercy is there, his love is there, his acceptance is there. Even though we know that there are things we do which we will continue to struggle with, continue to, to, to do battle with. And we will continue with that for the rest of our life because we're not going to suddenly become sinless. Okay? Not until we're up there. And so there will be those constant things. But we're battling with the Lord. Uh, he is there uh, with us in this. But that just shows our acceptance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That shows our acceptance of Christ's work in our lives. This is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This is not even recognizing the Holy Spirit is at work. Uh, turn to uh, 1 Timothy 12. Remember Paul. And if you want to know more about Paul's life, go to the early chapters of Acts, where there was Saul, who was Paul, who was there, uh, who was supporting people who were persecuting, putting to death followers of the way. Look at Paul. Was he indeed one who, in a sense, blasphemed against the Holy Spirit? Yes, he was there. He was one of those who denied the work of Christ. And yet, Jesus meets with Paul, as Jesus can meet with each one of us. And a dramatic thing happened. So 1 Timothy uh, 1, 12 to 13, uh, Paul says when he's writing to Timothy, I thank him, Jesus, who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, according, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that, in, that are in Christ Jesus. There'll be people who say, you know what? There was a time when I wasn't going God's way. There was a time when I thought all this was garbage. There's a time when I turned my back. It's Paul. I received mercy. I received mercy. There's always mercy. That blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that might have been a time period. There is still repentance for you in that. To accept that Jesus Christ is, is alive and active in your lives. He is the Lord of your life. <laughs> you know, Paul, he went about uh, killing uh, Christians. That's a pretty extreme uh, turnabout for him. But God still uh, showed him mercy. And uh, Paul receives grace. And we, of course, can. Uh, receive forgiveness as could the, the the apostles there as well they could have received uh, forgiveness they could have received forgiveness if they had turned and we know some of them nicodemus and others who whether they were part of this group but they certainly became followers of jesus nicodemus uh, had come to jesus at night and then later on we see him in the daytime uh, involved in the burial of jesus and there would have been others as well so certainly there was that, that turning around. So just that challenge for us, don't reject God's work in your lives. God's work um, in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit um, and the, the amazing work that he does through, through the word, through sacrament, uh, through other people, through the church. Um, don't harden your heart to God's work. 
And that is a challenge for people inside the church as well. When they can be doing the right things, going through the motions, but are still hardening their heart to the work of God. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus and don't harden your hearts. And don't worry about it. If you're worrying about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it probably means that you're going God's way and you totally accept and the Holy Spirit's totally working in your life. So now we come to the other side of this uh, Mark and Samuel. Verse 31. And his mother, Jesus' mother and his brothers came. Remember, they'd come to seize him and they were standing outside. They sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my brother and my mothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my brother and my mother. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Wow. What happened to, to honor your father and mother? Mother and brother, they called to him. And he said, who, who are my mother and my brothers? Now, bear in mind, of course, at the cross, Jesus, his, his mother is there. And he says to John, John, this is your mother. Take care of her. Don't leave her as, as a widow by herself. So there was compassion there. And I'm sure Jesus and his uh, mother and brothers had a conversation about this afterwards. And Jesus explained uh, what he was talking about. Um, but th this moment, they've come. They want to take him away. They want to restrain him. Wow. You know, uh, must have thought he totally lost it. Um, I remember Jesus is not against the sort of the family structure that's going on here, but he's bringing into this a sort of a tension that's going on. We have our families, but for many of us also, we might have a spiritual family, a spiritual mentor, a spiritual brother, a spiritual parent who may not be our biological parent, who often aren't. Um, and, and we can therefore have both lots. And so he's bringing in this, this spiritual family, spiritual allegiance. Um, and he's saying that that is a higher priority than your physical one. Now, this was a complete turnaround for the time. Uh, because for the Israelites, well, biological family, you don't always see it reading through the Old Testament. But biological family was very, very important. You know, they were children of Abraham, right? It was all about their descendants, the seeds of Abraham. That mattered. That mattered for them. And, um, you know, and you can have access to God through those religious leaders, which were often their, their biological um, family members. They needed to be part of a family for them. But Jesus is saying, hang on a minute. You know what? They've missed their opportunity. I have come in and I'm bringing something uh, new in people come to to jesus not because they think he's, he's crazy but because he's possessed by satan but people come along um because uh, he's carrying out the will of god and so people are following jesus and being a child of uh, christian parents well or, or jewish parents here that will not Jesus saying, make you a Christian by itself. You cannot just rely on the fact that oh, my parents go to church, I'm okay. It doesn't work that way. It's all about faith in God alone. And then out of that, it might be your mentors, our, our spiritual family members as well. And so Jesus is saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you're part of this, this religious structure that's going on. Those who are should be careful because it's about our own faith, that we are connected to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We need to be following him and doing the will of God, being part of God's family, this spiritual family, even one uh, where apparently the leader is, uh, is crazy or possessed, which, well, we can work that out for ourselves. But um, we know that we can seek him. We can search him out. We can turn to him. We know that there's forgiveness for whatever we've said and done. Even if it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, there is still forgiveness in that. 
and we too can be part of this spiritual family. Yes, our families matter. And we honor our fathers and mothers, but we are also part of a spiritual family of God, walking together as disciples. Amen. <laughs>